<laughs> okay, I would like to call to order the September 17th, 2020 TPA Governing Board meeting. Pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order Number 20-69 and TPA Emergency Order Number 2020-04, the Palm Beach TPA is conducting this meeting virtually using the Zoom webinar platform. The TPA selected this platform because it does not require the public to purchase or download any additional software or, or equipment to attend this meeting. Aside from the Zoom webinar platform that the participants will use to attend remotely, the public will have no discernible difference in their ability to watch the meeting from that of someone physically attending the meeting. Instructions to join this virtual meeting as well as contact information for a TPA staff member to assist you are provided in the published meeting agenda. Please note that although some members of the governing board are attending the meeting in person, yeah, there's quite a few of us, TPA board members will be appearing at today's meeting remotely, either via webcam or telephone. Additionally, scheduled presenters and the executive director will also be appearing via webcam or telephone. Before we, look at, we begin, I will summarize our public comment procedure for this virtual meeting. Written documents, comments, and questions can be submitted online at the website provided in the agenda. Verbal comment can also be made live through the Zoom webinar platform. When you wish to be recognized, please use the raised hand function within the Zoom platform and then wait to be recognized by the chair and unmuted by the meeting host. Lastly, an in-person visitor may submit a comment card available at the welcome table. Now, I haven't asked Mayor Wilson, but I hear you are online. Mayor Wilson, would you please open our meeting in prayer and then lead us in the pledge? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you once again with bowed heads and humble hearts, thanking you for your grace and your mercy, realizing, Father, that over and over again, that through your grace and your mercy, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And with that, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your comfort and hope, especially during times like these. What will we do without you, Lord? We ask you to give us the faith to believe that you can and you will bring good out of our current situation. Help us to see and understand what you're trying to show us during this time of adversity. Father, we have sinned against you over and over again, and yet you still offer us the opportunity to place our concerns in your care. You are awesome and loving. We just as a people must learn how to be awesome and loving the same. And finally, Father, we ask you to bless the chairperson of this meeting. You know her heart and all of us whom you have allowed to be assembled here today. Guide our words as well as our deeds and actions so that we can be a helpmate and not a hurtmate towards each other because we realize that to each other, we're just friends who are not yet met. We give you all the praises and the glory. Amen. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? To the allegiance of the United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Wilson. Your words always inspire us, and thank you for that. Uh, Margie, let's see, staff, yes, please call the roll so we can establish a quorum. And I'm going to have my staff on my other end unmute the virtual attendees, but it may prompt on your side as well. Uh, Joseph Anderson, Mary Lou Berger, Commissioner Mac Bernard uh, as a replacement, Joni Brinkman, here, Joel Flores, Stephen Graham, present, Jim Koreski. Present. Douglas Lawson. Yeah, okay, Present. Maria Moreno. Here. Melissa McKinley. Here. Michael Napoleon. Here. Corey Nearing. Here. Joseph Paduzzi. Here. Charlie Petroleum. Here. Fred Pinto. Here. Scott Singer. Here. 
Andy Thompson. Thankful to be here. Pam Triolo. Vice Mayor Andy Amoroso, alternate. Kyle Balachay. Here. Robert Myra. Here. Greg Weiss. Here. Dave Wilson. Here. Rev. Corn, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Okay. Moved and a second. Yeah. So I have a motion by Wynott, second by McKinley. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? <laughs> Thank you. Motion carries. Now may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the July 16th, 2020 meeting? So moved. I have a move from Commissioner Weinhoff. Do you have a second, please? Second. Just sitting behind you. Grant. Second for Mayor Grant. Thank you. It's a little tough to have you behind. Don't get my mask on. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank aye. You. aye. Thank you, the motion carries. Um, so now we're on to comments from the chair and member comments. And well, I will start by saying thank you to all of you who supported me in the August primary for County Commission District 1. I am excited to be in the general election in November. Um, I have been writing a candidate, so make sure you go and vote. Make sure you make it to the bottom of the ballot to vote for County Commission District 1. <laughs> um, but, what that means is I am resigning my role as CPA chair. This is my last meeting. So going forward, it means that uh, in October, Mayor Pinto will assume the role of the CPA chair. And you will have at that time the opportunity to elect a vice chair for the remainder of 2020. I hope to return to the CPA board in December when we do our reorganization at the commission. And I hope to represent you as I have in the past. Um, on another note, I, I participated in the SEFTC <laughs> virtual meeting on August 7th, where we formally adopted the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. And the regional plan will be presented to each of the three South Florida MPOs for corresponding action in October. So, on to business, if any board member has a comment for the board, please utilize your raised hand function. I can't see it on here, so Margie, it's up to you. Yeah, just I'll let you know. And then I do have Mayor Grant has his hand raised on here too. Good thing. <laughs> and we, we recognize and remember to unmute your microphone once you are recognized. Good morning, board. Uh, the reason why I'm asking uh, for comments is that we received a letter of intent uh, for one of the Boynton Beach CRA's property on 115 North Federal. That is across the street from the historic uh, Flagler Railroad train station. And this got me looking and researching regarding transit. And I saw that we, the Palm Beach County had a concept of a coastal tri-rail from 2013 on Wikipedia. The, the issue is, is that I know that we were going to have a conversation, um, but we have still have not had that conversation regarding transit. And so my request would be is that we have, uh, you know, uh, an action, an informational item for the board to discuss at our next meeting about uh, the coastal transit system, uh, because right now it's a concept, an idea, it's not a plan. And so I want to see if the, board is willing to move forward with making it more of a plan instead of just a concept and an idea. Well, I can actually comment on, on that, as can Nick and as can Hal. Um, yes, we did meet several times over the last several years uh, with the, the concept of the coastal link and terminating up in Jupiter, uh, Palm Beach Gardens being actually the really hub of the North End several stops along the way and crossing over from Mangonia over onto the Brightline tracks. And with the advent of what's going on with Brightline right now, or I don't know if they're calling themselves uh, at this point in time, but um, that was put on hold because there aren't actually any dollars to, to do this, but uh, we met in house We met in house office uh, several times. Um, actually myself, Mayor, uh, Mayor James and Hal, and several others to talk about the coastal link, and we put it on hold because there was not enough information from Brightline and what was going to be um, 
an action in concert with right line and tri rail. So it is something that is, even though it is um, on the back burner, it's not. It's something that is actually on everybody's mind in a constant manner. But Nick, you want to add to that? Can you hear me? By the way, I wasn't really speaking at the time. Okay. I'm right now, so they can hear you. Perfect. Nick, you want to add to that? Um, yeah. Thanks, Madam Chair. I would. I'm going to mention that we have certainly been working with FEC and with TriRail on the potential for passenger rail service on the FEC, potential for additional commuter rail service on the FEC. I've actually spoken with Mayor Grant, and I think it, with with the board's with yeah with the board's permission, what I would like to do in response to his request is at least compile a list of the existing agreements that have been established between local governments and Brightline to operate passenger service or to expand the provision of passenger service on the FEC railway corridor. I think it would be helpful for the rest of the board to understand a little bit more about what's happened in Boca Raton, as well as what's happened in Aventura and what is underway or what's under negotiation in uh, Miami-Dade County. And so, I would, unless there's a board opposition to compiling that information, I would like to actually take it upon our, our staff's uh, shoulders to compile that information and present it. I would request a little more time than just the next meeting in order to compile that and present it. But we would we would take that as an initiative, uh, a board direction, and try to present that to the full TPA for their, as an information item. So, um, Chair, I make a motion for that to be part of that block back as an information item when TPA uh, has that uh, information. Chair, I'm sorry, I do have that. Commissioner McKinley has her hand raised as well. Commissioner McKinley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Mayor Grant, I think the appropriate action would just be to give formal staff direction for the suggestion. But in part of this conversation, uh, back when I joined the county legislative affairs team in 2010, we were talking about not only just linking South Florida, but the return of passenger rail from Jacksonville down to Miami on that same corridor. I'm not sure where those conversations stand. But just about every municipality in that corridor has signed a letters of support. So maybe our legislative affairs team could join in that update. Uh, Nick, if you're going to bring back that proposal, let's have a, uh, a much bigger conversation, not just targeted to South Florida, but to the whole East Coast. Thank you. So do we need a motion, Nick? Or can we just... Chair, I have, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Vice right. Mayor um, Weimar. Thank you. I would just uh, add that I think we need to invite uh, uh, Warren Commissioner uh, Abrams to uh, give us uh, some input from the uh, tri-rails perspective so that we can have all the information at the same time. Any other hands raised? No, Madam Chair. Thank you. Sorry. No, Madam Chair. Perfect. Thank you. Nick, you want to add to this? Yeah, I'm fine. I, I think as long as there's no board opposition, I'm fine with taking this as direction to prepare this this content and involve the legislative affairs as well as the uh, SFRTA staff in the development of the content. So do we need to make a motion for to put this on the agenda or is this just an action item in the future? In, I'm sorry, information item in the future. I have what I need unless you feel that you want to memorialize it in a motion. I don't think I've heard any Anybody saying negative about this? So I think we're okay where we are. Okay. So at this point, Nick, can you review the director's report? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the TPA board. It's a pleasure to see you both in person and virtually this morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief update on some things that are happening right now and things that are upcoming in our community. First, I wanted to give you an update on federal funding authorization. We operate under an act in a, a congressional action entitled the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act. And that act was a five-year authorization bill for federal funding that is set to expire on September 30th unless a new authorization or a stopgap funding bill is enacted by Congress. So I want you to know that we are paying close attention to that, that we are speaking with and working with our congressional delegation as well as our national MPO coalitions and our statewide MPO coalitions to support a new federal transportation authorization. And we are working with them to increase 
the flexibility and the funding levels available for TPA priority projects. So we'll keep you posted on that, mostly by email in between the, this board meeting and the next TPA board meeting. I also want to mention item two, we had adopted a strategic plan in July and one of those items in our strategic plan was to pursue a distinguished, distinguished workplace designations. And this month we pursued and were awarded the designation of a bicycle friendly business at the TPA. We, we received a silver designation by the League of American Bicyclists. We are excited to provide a bike friendly workplace for people who work here as well as visitors. And we do want to remind you and encourage our local governments, our businesses, and our universities. Different kinds of designations are available for community-wide uh, requests as well as facility-wide requests like a business or a university for their entire campus. We want to encourage you to pursue bike-friendly designations and uh, note that the next deadline to submit an application is the October 1st date. And more information is available at that website. We are working with the DOT as well as our railway operators on what we're calling Rail Safety Week. We are observing Rail Safety Week September 21st through 27th, so that's later this month, to promote rail safety education and encourage our public to stay safe, especially near highway grade crossings and railroad rights of way. And there's more information available again at that website. In the past several years, the next item on our list is uh, we have conducted, with the, in partnership with the DOT, what we call a transportation planning exchange or Transplex Conference. It has been an in-person conference in Orlando the past several years, and this year it is going to be a virtual web webinar series on Friday mornings. I, I want to make sure that the TPA board members understand this and avail themselves of the opportunity to participate in these webinars. They're not long. There's only, uh, I think they, they run for an hour, maybe hour and a half, two hours on Friday mornings. And October 2nd, we have a focus on transportation and land use planning. And on October 9th, we have a focus on broadband infrastructure and the provision of broadband access to our communities, especially as we are trying to figure out how to, how to negotiate this virtual world. And I think that's a conversation that our TPA board has expressed a, a great deal of interest in at prior meetings. Uh, next item on the list is want to remind everyone that while we are contemplating how to return to school in person, we are also promoting walking to school as a way of healthy community, as a way to promote healthy communities and improve safety, bringing an awareness to the uh, experience of our, of our children and their parents, their family members who help and walk them to school. And uh, National Walk to School Day is October 7th. We are encouraging any of our local schools that are interested and are able to uh, provide an event to do that any really any day in October. Uh, we understand that, that October 7th is coming quickly and we haven't figured out yet how to return to school in person in our public system. Uh, but we want to encourage our local school district to uh, consider uh, walk to school events and uh, definitely want to make you aware of any events that are happening, especially within your jurisdictions, so that you can participate as well as local elected officials. And following up on that, the DOT has created, the Florida DOT has created a statewide Safe Routes to School program. They've done this by taking federal safety funds that are given to the state of Florida each year, and a portion of them they have uh, repurposed or designated, rather, for the Safe Routes to School program. They receive or request applications on an annual basis, and they are seeking those applications through December 31st to help communities address school transportation needs and to encourage more students to walk or bicycle to school. Uh, again, following up on that same theme of walking and bicycling safety, DOT has also created, again, using federal transportation dollars they, that are allocated to the state, they have created what they call a High Visibility Enforcement Grant Program to promote pedestrian and bicycle safety. Essentially, what they do is they've identified high crash locations in Florida, and they encourage local law enforcement agencies to submit grant applications to the DOT for overtime funding for law enforcement officers to uh, to be stationed in particular high crash locations and to observe the behaviors of both the drivers, the pedestrians, and the bicyclists, promote healthy and safe behaviors, and correct unhealthy and illegal behaviors in those locations. 
Uh, again, more information is available. We've had a number of our local law enforcement agencies participate in this program already, but we do want to make every um, community that does operate local law enforcement aware of that because Palm Beach County is one of the target areas for this funding. Uh, a topic, last two on the list, the topic that is uh, near and dear to several of our communities and, and it's definitely a conversation that we are wrestling with in several locations is this idea of lane repurposing whether a road that has provided a certain number of travel lanes primarily for vehicles is a potential candidate for reconstruction or repurposing some of that space to provide either better access for transit or uh, more, I guess, wider and more uh, provisional space for pedestrians and bicyclists. And uh, DOT, in support of that conversation on a statewide basis, has published an updated lane repurposing guidebook. One of the items in the guidebook that's really caught my attention is that there are five case studies identified in the guidebook that are worth reading through. A couple of them are in Southeast Florida and three others are in other parts of the state. But it gives you a sense that we are not the only part of Florida that is having conversations like this, that's wrestling with how do we best use the limited space in our road rights of way. And then lastly, I want to remind the, the TPA Governing Board that the Safe Street Summit, which is a partnership between the three Southeast Florida MPOs, the Miami-Dade, the Broward, and the Palm Beach MPOs, um, to promote safer streets and the construction and operation of safer streets in all of our communities. That has been an in-person conference in the beginning of the last several calendar years, and this year we are going to be providing it as a virtual experience on the afternoon of January 28th, and then all day on January 29th, and we ask you that you would save the date and hope that you will be able to participate in that virtual experience. And Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Nick. Do I have any board members have any comments on the director's report? Thank you, James Grace. No, Madam Chair, I don't see any hands would any board member, we're on to consent now, would any board member like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Any hands raised? No, Madam Chair. Hearing none, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Weinbach. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any nays? Do we have any comment? Cards? Oh, sorry, motion passes. Do we have any comment cards? No, Madam Chair. All right. So now we are on to action items. And I'd like to invite Jason Price, TPA TIP coordinator, to present this item. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, let's see. This morning I'll present. Amendment number one for the transportation improvement program. This is an action item that will require a vote at the end of the presentation. So to begin, the roll forward is always the first amendment to the transportation improvement program and it involves rolling forward funds not obligated in the fiscal year 2020 in the previous uh, transportation improvement program and rolling those funds forward into the first year of the currently adopted uh, transportation improvement program. The total amount that is being rolled forward is approximately $14 million and it affects 105 projects. What you see here is uh, I've, cons I've listed the top seven projects that have uh, movement of funds, a roll forward of funds greater than 500,000. And typically all of the, most of these funds, when I looked through all of the projects were predominantly in the right of way phase. And you can see from the columns here, uh, the first column is what was in the current tip and the amount that was being rolled forward. And then the new amount that will be represented in the adopted, uh, the amended tip after this is adopted. And this is just the balance of the other four projects. So there was a total of seven projects that had uh, a change of over 500,000. Uh, that's all I have at this time. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. 
Thank you, Jason. Are there any public comments on this item? No, Madam Chair. And do we have any hands raised? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Motion to adopt. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Mayor Grant. Any discussion? Madam Chair, this does require a roll call vote. Okay, please call the roll. So just to confirm, I have a motion to adopt a resolution approving amendment number one to the TPA's fiscal year 21 to 25 tip. I had a motion by Vice Mayor Weinroth and a second by Mayor Grant. I will have staff unmute and if you can please unmute on your end as well. Joseph Anderson. Matt Bernard. I'll come back to Commissioner Bernard. Joni Brinkman? Yes. I'm sorry, can you say it into the microphone for the yes. record? Thank you. Uh, Joel Flores. Stephen Grant? Yes. Jim Koreski? Yes. Douglas Lawson? Yes. Roy Moreno? Yes. Melissa McKinley? Yes. Michael Napoleon? Yes. Corey Neary? Uh, no, and Madam Host, I can't come off video. I, I need the privilege to be able to do that. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner. You're, I, I didn't catch the last part. I've been trying to start my video for the last 10 minutes. I can't, it says I need to get the host to, to allow me to do that. Okay, we will um, work on it on our end. I'm not sure there shouldn't be a restriction for you to turn your, you. your camera you. back on, but we will work on getting that turned back on. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Joseph Paduzzi. I'm unable to turn my camera on either. I've been trying for a while. Um, I'm voting no to the due to the inclusion of the State Road 7 projects. We will work on uh, correcting that. My apologies. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Um, Shelly Petrolia? Yes. Brian Pinto? Yes. Scott Singer? Yes. Andy Thompson? Yes. Andy Amoroso? Yes. Tom Alashe? Yes. Robert Weinrod? Yes. Greg Weiss? No, and I also cannot turn on my video. Okay, we will look into that. Steve Wilson? Yes. And again, uh, Mac Bernard? Yes. Thank you. It passes by the chair. Thank you. Is there anyone else having trouble with their video? Madam Chair, this is Douglas Lawson. I'm having trouble starting my video as well. Thank you, staff. You looking at Yes. All right, thank you. All right, so the motion carries. Now we are on to uh, item to adopt a resolution approving a revised public participation plan. And Melissa Booth, TPA Public Relations Manager, is to present this item. Good morning, everyone. I believe they've corrected the problem with the video. So if everyone tries again, I think you'll be successful as I was. Uh, we're going to review the highlights of updates that we're proposing for our public participation plan today. There's no prescribed schedule for updates for the plan. They're done as needed. And so we are proposing some updates for the first time in three years. We did a major update that was adopted in October of 2017. So we're just bringing up some updates uh, that are necessary at this time. And in summary, those highlights include, excuse me, those hi highlights of those updates include the official form of public notice the LRTP and TIP adoption policy, we're going to ask you to consider, consistency with the TPA operating procedures and public participation goals and objectives. 
And previously, we've, all, we've had consistently that the website is the primary form of public notification, but we place stronger emphasis on that throughout the document so that everyone understands that for meeting dates and details and for public comment opportunities on draft documents and plans, that the website is the primary source for that information. And we're proposing a new LRTP and TIP adoption policy. What is it? It requires approval or rejection of an entire LRTP or TIP document. It requires re uh, requests for project additions or deletions to be heard as proposed amendments at a future meeting. Why do it? To ensure adequate public notice for interested parties, to provide clarity for voting members, to maintain balance between available funds and project costs, and to allow staff review of add and delete impacts. And I would emphasize that there, of course, are opportunities for modifications to be proposed at the committee level in the earlier stages. But once we get to the final document that is presented for public review and included in your agenda packet is what we are pro proposing would be voted on as is as it's presented to you. Consistency with the TPA operating procedures. Uh, the new pub updates to the public participation plan acknowledges this new document that was adopted for the first time uh, in April of this year, earlier this year, primarily in response to the COVID pandemic. It, uh, the updates eliminate superseded references to individual sets of bylaws that previously existed and it addresses public participation for virtual meetings when those are legally authorized. And the public participation goals and objectives uh, that used to be part of the public participation plan have been removed. The updates remove the goals, objectives, targets, and measures, and instead it reflects their inclusion and reporting within the TPA strategic plan. And that allows for the goals, actions, and outcomes to be more specific, more frequently updated, and aligned with the TPA's unified planning work program. And with that, I would be happy to address any questions before you consider a motion to adopt the current revisions proposed for the public participation plan. Thank you very much. And do we have any public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair, and I have that uh, Vice Mayor Weinroth and Mayor Grant have their hands raised. Okay, Vice Mayor Weinroth. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I'm happy to see that we're making the, uh, the change to our policy with respect to the LRTP. Obviously, the pain we went through with the changes that went on at one of our meetings, uh, ad hoc changes to that plan. I think it's uh, much more appropriate that it have an up and down vote. And if there are some additions or deletions, they'd be considered prior there too. So I think this was a, a, a appropriate amendment to our uh, procedures. Thank you. Mayor Gray. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you know I realized after doing the LRTP is that we've had those for every five years for a long time. And I was unable to get an outcome on previous LRTPs. I know I was looking at previous ones and there's supposed to be a, a palm trim around on Little Bright Road, which never followed through. And so uh, I saw with the, the consultant that we hired, I'd like to see when we do public outreach that we do more of a, a public engagement and we show them what the TPA has done with the previous LRTPs, things that we've accomplished and things that we have not accomplished. So that way um, uh, our public can, can realize if they are correct, and then you've been saying this for five years, 10 years, or 15 years, and things have been done or things have not been done. So I don't know if this is um, part of the public uh, participation plan to be more of a engagement instead of just outreach finding what they want now. I think we need to help educate them, help educate the public of what the TPA or the previous you know, we're known as the MPO has done every 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, so that we have a better understanding of where we're going in the future. Thank you, Mary Green. 
Nick, anything you want to add to that? Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a helpful suggestion, and it would probably be useful information for all of our TPA board members to have a better understanding of the major categories of projects that we have funded over prior long range plans, and then what portion of the individual projects that we had identified for implementation were actually constructed, what portion are still waiting in the development process, and what portion did we identify as useful and then later decide were not appropriate and, and move out of the long range plan. So I, I think it's a welcome suggestion and, and uh, something that we would be happy to compile and present to the TPA at a future meeting. Thank you. Well, since we've had discussion before, I'm sure. Chair, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh. I do have the Commissioner McKinley has her hand raised as well. Commissioner McKinley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm waiting until you are done with your comments. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, normally we do the motion in the second, and then we have discussion, and we're a little out of order, but that's okay. Well, I'll make that easier for you then. Um, first, I want to thank Nick and the TPA team for listening to our concerns about how this was handled uh, late last year. So with that, Madam Chair, I'm going to move approval of item 2AB, a motion to adopt a resolution approving a revised public participation plan. Thank you. I have a second. Can I have a second for Commissioner Weinrock? This is a roll call vote, correct? Yes, Madam Chair. All right, would you please call the roll? Matt Bernard. <coughs> uh, Joni Franklin. Yes. Joel Flores. Stephen Grant. Yes. Jim Koreski. Yes. Douglas Lawson. Yes. Maria Marino. Yes. Melissa McKinley. Yes. Michael Napoleon. Yes. Corey Neary. Yes. Joseph Peduzzi? Yes. Charlie Petroleum? Yes. Fred, oh, thank you, Mayor. Fred Pinto? Yes. Scott Singer? Yes. Andy Thompson? Yes. Pam Triola? I'm sorry, Andy Amorosa? Yes. Tom Alishay? Yes. Robert Weinroth? Yes. Greg Weiss? Yes. Steve Wilson? Yes. And just to confirm, I'm sorry, Matt Bernard? Yes. Thank you. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we move on to item C, motion to adopt a resolution endorsing a diverging diamond interchange at 995 and going through with requested modifications. I invite Benita. I'm going to, I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm Sandy? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, actually, I believe we, we're going to have Steve Braun initiate okay. his presentation. I'm sorry for the notes. Uh, Benita is the project manager for this, and Steve is the director of development for the District 4 office. And Steve asked if he could give some opening remarks, and then he's going to turn it over to the consultant Lee to present this item to the TPA board. Okay, so Steve, I turn it over to you. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes thank you. Great. Uh, good morning. I hope every, everyone's doing well um, under these circumstances. Um, again, commending the, the TPI for continuing uh, to have these meetings and for giving us an opportunity uh, to present this important project. Um, you know, obviously, we value the partnership with, with the TPA. And we do welcome uh, feedback on, on our project. Um, as I think a lot of you know, I've, I've worn several hats uh, over the course of this project, um, really going back even to the plan in PD&E and, and then most recently the de design phase for this. So I thought at, at least to give some introductory remarks, which I appreciate. Um, I think some of you may also recall um, that the Glades Road interchange with I-95 had been programmed as a separate project over the years, we've integrated that project into the I-95 express lane project, uh, really to, to consolidate th those projects and, and have an opportunity to, to implement the interchange improvement. Uh, we are excited at this point to be in, in the design build phase, uh, which technically, I, I think from our perspective, is the construction phase. So we have a design build team um, you know, that, that pursued this, this and was awarded this contract. Um, and one of the opportunities through design build is to 
to, to give uh, the industry, the design build firms, an opportunity to, to present uh, innovative ideas, uh, unique approaches to the project uh, that e even as the DOT went through developing this, it, it opens up for the design build firms uh, to present something creative or innovative. And that's exactly the case uh, that, that we're seeing here with this I-95 Glades Road interchange. The design build firm had presented a diverging diamond interchange or we'll call it a DDI, um, which I, I think this board ha has seen previous uh, projects talk about diverging diamonds. But in this case, the, the design build firm presented it to the department. We've extensively reviewed it. Um, and we're at a point where the, the design build firm uh, is approved to, to move forward with this concept uh, for implementation. And they've worked extensively internally with, with DOT reviewers and also very closely with the city of Boca Raton. And we appreciate the partnership with the city and the feedback that we received from the city uh, on this project. Um, as I think some of you realize or, or have seen, um, you know, the first diverging diamond uh, implemented by FDOT was on the West Coast, the I-75 University Parkway uh, in, in, in the Sarasota area. Um, after opening that, uh, project uh, you know, received national attention in a positive light as, as again, a, a creative way to address operations and safety at that interchange. And subsequent to that, there have been, I think about a handful, maybe four total diverging diamonds uh, implemented across the state. So this is our opportunity here uh, in District 4 and in Palm Beach County to, to implement a diverging diamond. It's a unique approach, as I've mentioned a few times. So we wanted to really just take this opportunity to, to present this to you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Nick uh, and, and his team uh, you know, for the opportunity to at least present a resolution of support for the project and um, also for the, the feedback that the TPA staff has provided uh, you know, for the department to consider as we move forward with this project. So with that, uh, we have a couple of slides that I'll go through and then I'll hand off to the, the consultant uh, representing the design build firm. Next slide, please. So the, the limits, uh, as I mentioned, the, the interchange is, is within the I-95 uh, express lane project really from south of, uh, um, yeah, uh, south of Glades Road, um, you know, up to Linton Boulevard. And so it, it um, includes those interchanges, but primarily the, 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 the interchange of the focus of this presentation is the I-95 and Glades. I mentioned the municipalities we've been working th with closely, obviously the city of Boca Raton for this interchange, and then also Delray Beach. Next slide. So again, the overall project goal, right, implement the express lanes, uh, create uh, travel choices uh, consistent with um, you know, travel time reliability, especially during the peak times, imp improve mobility, uh, relieve congestion, um, and then ultimately at this interchange, improve operations and safety and, and reduce, reducing congestion levels at the interchange. Um, again, working closely with the city, looking at aesthetic opportunities as well, um, and, and really just focusing on, on the multimodal uh, mobility through the interchange. Next slide, please. So at this point, I, I really am, am very comfortable handing off to Jose Otero from um, WSP, who is representing the, the Prince WSP design build group. Um, although that, that configuration on the screen looks pretty overwhelming, uh, Jose is going to really uh, spend a moment really uh, giving you an understanding of how a divergent diamond in, in, interchange operates and also focus on, on some of the uh, benefits of, of this configuration at this location. So with that, I'll, I'll hand off to Jose and then, then uh, we'll take some questions after the presentation. Thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Otero. I'm the roadway engineer of record for this project representing WSP USA in partnership with Prince Contracting, as Steve mentioned. Um, and what you're seeing before you is the, one of the early conceptual images of the DDI and the signing and markings on how it would look once it's constructed. Um, this is a conceptual image. Um, we, we're currently in final design and we're working with the TPA and the city of Boca and, and doing a lot of refinements to get this thing ready to be built. 
Um, but th this image kind of gets the message across and highlights what the interchange would look like ultimately. Um, one, one of the major reasons that we wanted to propose um, this interchange type at this specific location is because uh, at this point, there's been over 100 DDIs built in the United States and um, across about approximately 20 years with the first one being built in the early 2000s. So we've been able now to see a lot of the data and, and benefits that this interchange type offers. And um, really, in, as we move forward in engineering and, and engineer, engineering continues to evolve, we've, we've come to the realization that sometimes we can provide more with less. And uh, one of the very great things about this interchange type is that it meets the project objectives. It increases efficiency and operations of, of this location, which is one of the busiest roads in the city of Boca and definitely within Palm Beach County. And um, we're going to improve traffic operations. And for one of the most unique parts about the DDI is that this is one of the first interchange types that doesn't favor motorists. It actually has a pretty nice balance between benefiting the other users of these facilities, which are predominantly pedestrians, bicyclists, and this also lends itself to transit opportunities. So as we move into the future and, and start looking at more multimodal friendly designs, uh, the DDI gives us the benefit of achieving all of those goals while maintaining the landscape of this location more suburban. Um, you know, ultimately, sometimes we can achieve these same things and, and build out a lot of infrastructure. But luckily, at this occasion, we're able to keep things at grade and, and again, in a very suburban style so that aesthetically, you don't have to feel like you're in a very densely urban interchange as you navigate through it. Uh, so just to focus on the signing and markings a little bit, you'll notice that there's going to be a, a really strong overhead signing program, which will give drivers the designations as to which lane they should be in for each necessary movement. Uh, the big feature of the DDI that, that um, I guess is what's new about it and, and for all of us as, as drivers and, and residents of the area to acclimate to is that essentially as you navigate through the interchange, you will go to through two crossover intersections as we call them. Um, which you can see at the two integral parts of your screen. And at these crossover intersections, essentially what happens is we use natural roadway geometry to traverse the motorist onto what would otherwise be known as the other side or the wrong side of the road, if you will. And in doing so, we're able to eliminate left turn movements. And, and this offers a lot of advantages that I'll uh, further discuss as we move through the presentation. So as, as we mentioned, uh, safety is our focal point, um, but we also want to make sure that we improve traffic operations uh, for 20 years from now, is, which is the design year that we looked at 2040. Uh, as I mentioned, Glades Road is one of the most heavily congested corridors in both Boca and Palm Beach County. So we want to make sure that we can get motorists to their destinations in a very efficient and safe manner. And um, the, the graphic on your screen, we use a color coding system to represent that the level of service, which is essentially how we look at intersections from a delay standpoint, the, the less delay you experience at a signal, the higher the level of service. So we've come up with this color coded legend. Um, as you can see, level of service B and C represented by green colors are, are very, very good. And um, at least uh, D, which is the yellow color, that's the minimum level of service that is recommended by all uh, national um, criteria FHWA ASHTO as being properly serviceable. So you'll see that across the board we have all greens and uh, and one yellow at the very busy intersection of Airport Road and Glades, um, which is still again a, a great improvement from the existing conditions and what the existing conditions would look like in 20 years if we did nothing. So we already talked a little bit about the signing, um, and I guess the, the biggest concern a, a lot of folks have when, when they see this new interchange type um, be presented at, at several locations now, as I mentioned, across the United States, I believe there's about 118 DDIs that have been built at this point. Uh, Steve mentioned the first one that was built in the state of Florida uh, along I-75 on the west coast of Florida. There's another two that were built in Miami-Dade County along State Road 836, and there's about five that are currently being designed um, in South Florida. Uh, this being one of them, which will be the first one built in, in District Floor, District 4 of the FDOT and uh, Palm Beach County. And essentially, you'll see that as that crossover movement happens, you're just going to be told in advance of that which lane you want to be in if you want to either stay on Glades Road 
or enter I-95 southbound or northbound. And again, the, the, the most advantageous part of these crossover intersections is that by crossing drivers over onto the other side of the road, I can eliminate left turn movements from intersections, which um, left turns result in the most dangerous crash types at intersection locations, especially in urban interchange environments, which are uh, side impact crashes. And not only are they the most severe crash type, they're the crash type that leads to the most fatalities. Um, with our you know, vision zero process that we've adopted at DOT, we wanna envision a future where there's no crashes. And definitely we not only minimize the number of crashes, we also want to eliminate fatalities and reduce the severity of these crashes. So that's really the one of the strongest safety benefits of the DDI. And this signing and marking program will help realize that. Now, the, the, the reason I like VDIs and the reason why I think it's a great fit at Glades Road in particular is because there's a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists in this area. We have the school on the southeast corner. Um, a, lo a lot of city employees that go through this corridor, the utility services complex is to the northeast of the interchange. And essentially downtown is all the way to the east. So there's just a lot of different modes of, of transit that are being occupied by this corridor. And again, we wanna make sure that we're equally accommodating pedestrians and bicyclists. So on your slide in front of you, you're gonna see uh, two lane symbologies or two line symbologies, a brown one and a green one. The green movements represent the bicycle movements, uh, which will be within seven foot buffered bicycle lanes. And uh, the neat thing for bicyclists in this interchange type, if, um, if you're at an intermediate level or it's experienced enough bicyclists where you ride on the road within the bicycle lane, you actually don't have to shift or transition your movement. Uh, as you cross over to the intersection, you stay to the outside of the same bound of traffic without any adjustments. At a traditional intersection, uh, lefts are always pretty tricky if you have to make that movement as a bicyclist. So, so this uh, alleviates and addresses that. Now, I did mention, you know, I personally am a recreational bicyclist, so I don't know if I typically ride on the road, um, but for inexperienced bicyclists, we also have a 10 foot multi-use path within the median of the DDI, which is connected to by the brown pedestrian paths that you see. So those are your traditional sidewalks. And then again, in the median, you have a nice wide multi-use path for both the pedestrians and the inexperienced cyclists to safely navigate this interchange. Now, the, the crossover intersections, um, like, like with many things in engineering, uh, you know, there's a balance to the constraints that we have to evaluate and how we do designs. Uh, the one advantage that we do have at Glades Road is, is, again, there's been so many of these interchange types built across the last 20 years that we have the advantage of having been able to observe how those have operated across time. Um, one of the concerns with this interchange type at the beginning of its inception was the potential for wrong way driving maneuvers due to the oblique angles of the crossover intersections. And in the beginning, in the early 2000s, you know, uh, engineering judgment dictated that, that the more angle you could provide or the larger that angle that you could provide, uh, the safer that movement would be. Um, we've learned throughout the last 20 years that that's not the only factor at play here. Uh, there's actually a balancing act between providing a, a angles in the range of 30 to 50 degrees, as um, you can see the 30 degree shown on the left side of your screen as well as uh, really pronouncing what we're showing on the right side of your screen as that blue line that we're calling an eyebrow. And this is important because this is what's going to essentially guide the vision of the motorist to continue along the path that the geometry is dictating that you drive. So essentially, uh, most motorists, as they go through these interchange types, they'll tell you that after they drove through it, they didn't even notice that they crossed over. And the reason for that is that the natural roadway geometry encourages the driver to cross over just based on the curvature of the road. So this slide is kind of just reinforcing and showing you guys a little bit of the technicalities on how we've designed it. And um, the, the, the message really is that, again, safety is our, our predominant concern and we're taking all the measures to ensure that this is a safe intersection for all of the users of this facility on both sides of the interchange. And then, um, on this slide, the next two slides, really, I'm just, I wanna cover uh, the reasons we thought that this particular location would be a great candidate for implementing this interchange type. Um, the reason we were excited to propose it during the pursuit of this project and, and the reason that 
that I think everybody is at this point on board. There's a lot of proven enhancements and benefits to DDI. Uh, we've done a pretty thorough crash analysis along the main line of 95 and the interchange. And uh, this particular improvement is gonna represent a 9% crash reduction um, as a, one of the major benefits of the DDI. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're reducing conflict points. Uh, conflict points essentially are anywhere where pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists cross paths. Um, so as you can imagine, we wanna minimize those to the greatest extent possible. You're always gonna have some, but this interchange type uh, provides one of the least of all the interchanges that we construct in this country. Um, and then particular benefits that, that apply to the city of Boca, that, which is uh, a, a great advantage that we saw when we proposed it is um, we've eliminated a, a, a couple very large utility relocations for the major influent and effluent lines for the utility services complex that's on the northeast corner of the interchange. Um, those, in, those utility relocations were going to be very difficult to perform seamlessly. Uh, they were very expensive, so there was going to be significant impacts to all of the residents of Boca as we performed those switches. So we were happy to eliminate those. We also eliminated some right away acquisition so the city of Boca can keep all of their land. They don't have to dedicate it over to the, the state road facility. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've decreased the amount of delay that motorists will experience at, at all of the intersections within this interchange location. Um, and, and again, one of, one of my favorite parts, and I, I think one of the things that we emphasize as a team um, is that we don't want to build unnecessary infrastructure that might not be super appealing or aesthetically appealing to the eye of the people that live in this location and, and have to see this thing every day. So we've eliminated over 8,000 linear feet of retaining walls. Um, we've eliminated uh, some widenings that are no longer required with the DDI configuration, both along glades and along uh, I-985. Uh, we eliminated a ramp flyover bridge over Airport Road. Um, we've eliminated loop ramps that, that you have today in the existing condition. So we're just eliminating a lot of pavement. Uh, in, in exchange for all of this extra space that we have, uh, the Department of Transportation is going to be working with the city to engage a landscaping project to beautify this interchange in the corridor. As soon as our project is finished in construction, that project will commence. So with more real estate available for aesthetic features, we'll create something that's uh, uh, more sightly and, and appealing to the users of the facility. Uh, now, I just want to talk to you guys uh, about some of the extensive coordination and, and uh, community outreach that we've been doing that's being led by our PIO, Andy Pacini. Um, a lot of you guys probably know her. She's been involved in this area of, of City of Boca and, and this section of the 95 quarter for the better part of a decade. Uh, before this project, she was uh, the lead community outreach specialist for the Spanish River Boulevard design build project, which recently wrapped up construction of a couple years ago. So, you know, there's no one better for, for this area and for this project to communicate with all of the entities and stakeholders and residents. Um, you know, she knows the full story. Um, some of the project milestones that we've already accomplished, we had the construction open house at the beginning of this year, uh, pre-COVID, and we were able to have that in person. Uh, we had great great success and results and we got a lot of good feedback from the community. Um, we received approval from a safety and operations standpoint of the DDI in August and now we are working towards getting our NEPA reevaluation approved uh, which we're hoping to get in October and construction of the DDI at Glades will commence at the very beginning of 2021. So as I mentioned, uh, Andy has been doing a phenomenal job of coordinating with all the stakeholders on this project. And just between uh, so many busy corridors, you can imagine that there's a, a lot of important stakeholders. Um, all of the, the entities shown on the screen, um, is, it's we're not just coordinating with or have coordinated with, it's an ongoing conversation. And um, we're working towards reaching a product that, that everybody is satisfied with in a very mutually beneficial way. And on, on this slide, it's pretty much just for information purposes, um, due to the time constraints of this presentation, uh, we didn't show it, but we actually have a very neat video that takes you through the driver's seat eye as if you were driving through the DDI. And it'll walk you through from your, your car seat perspective, each movement, so you can kind of get a preview of what driving this interchange type will feel like. Uh, you guys can find that video on the website listed here. 
And if you have any public inquiries, uh, please feel free to contact Andy Pacini and um, she'll direct any questions anyone may have to the project team. Her contact information is listed here. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I understand the TPA will be doing a follow-up presentation and after that we can entertain any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. This time I'd like to invite Nick to or Nick or staff to follow up with any additional items. Thank you, Madam Chair. That gets through me this morning. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do a very brief presentation. I want to commend the DOT and their design team, uh, the consultant design team for the creativity and innovation that they've already applied to the proposed interchange configuration. I think it is a very good project. And we, uh, as I said to Steve Braun before the meeting, we, we think that they're 95% of the way there. We, we just have a couple of tweaks that we think will actually enhance the safety for some of our vulnerable users without impacting or even potentially benefiting, the, these modifications may even potentially benefit the efficiency provided for the cars that are traveling through the interchange. Uh, Alyssa, go to the second slide. So the first requested modification that we have the way that the DOT has proposed the design of the eastbound right turn movement, so folks traveling east on Glaze Road who want to turn right and get onto the on-ramp to go south on I-95, they've actually proposed this lane to be a shared right turn and through lane, which requires them to place the bicycle facility on the outside of the lane and requires all of the right turning vehicles to cross the bicycle facility and any of the bike users that would be willing to ride through the interchange will only have about 50 feet of that, the width of that on-ramp at the highlighted location to negotiate the crossing of all of that vehicular traffic and the vehicles will be required to yield to the bicycles that are crossing that entrance to the on-ramp at that location. It's not a very comfortable exchange of the right of way and so what we're suggesting is in fact for the efficiency of the right turn movement and for the safety of the bicycles that the DOT should consider converting that shared lane to an exclusive right turn lane and relocating the on road bicycle facility to what we call the keyhole location between the right turn lane and the through lane which would have the beneficial effect of allowing a driver to negotiate the requirement to yield to the bicyclist when crossing the bike facility over the entire length of the turn lane instead of limiting that negotiated point to only the 50 feet at the on-ramp opening. So again, we think that that's a safer condition for the people on the bicycles. It's actually a safer condition for the people on vehicles. And it also increases the efficiency of that right turn movement by eliminating any potential for a through vehicle or a number of through vehicles to queue up at the stop bar and block access to the on-ramp. And Madam Chair, I only have three slides, but I, I see Commissioner Valachet has already wanted to opine on that particular point. My, my only question would be at some Commissioner, point, if we get you for, for the benefit of the others, sure. Yeah, as um, at some point, the bicyclists are still going to have to cross the lane of traffic, assuming you're on the outside lane further west of the intersection or, and of the right turn lane you know if they're on the outside of the road then they're going to have to cross that right turn movement lane prior to getting you know to get between the two they're going to have to cross some traffic that's right but, but our point is if you look at the entire length of the right turn lane as it's developed here it's, it's around five maybe seven hundred feet uh, the idea is if you put the bicycle facility between the through and the right turn lane that any vehicles that want to enter the right turn lane will have that full 700 foot length to decide whether to speed up and pass a bicycle in advance or to slow down and allow the bicycle to continue forward, uh, yielding the right of way to the bicycle. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, and so that's, that's our first suggested modification. And it actually builds upon our second request. Now, Alyssa, if you go to the second slide. The, the DOT, at the, the way they've laid out that right turn movement, again, eastbound to southbound, they noted that they're providing a shared use pathway that crosses the on-ramp at a designated location with a crosswalk, and they intend to post signs on either side of the crosswalk indicating to drivers that if a pedestrian is waiting there, you ought to yield to, consistent with state law, you ought to yield the right-of-way to that pedestrian. Practically, that rarely occurs. 
And so what we're suggesting is it would be an appropriate addition to the project is the installation of what's called a rectangular rapid flash beacon. That's a pedestrian actuated device that begins flashing when a pedestrian is waiting to use the crosswalk and pushes a button on the pole that includes that, that flashing device. That increases the visibility for the pedestrian and it also increases the, uh, reinforces the message to the motorist traveling up to that point that the motorist is obligated to yield to the pedestrian. It, it creates a safer environment to negotiate that potential conflict point between a vehicular user and a, and a more vulnerable pedestrian or a bicyclist crossing that crosswalk. Alyssa, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, we're, we're suggesting a similar installation for the westbound to northbound on-ramp that is also proposed to be a right turn free flow condition with a crosswalk for the pedestrian and bicycle users on the shared use pathway. And we're suggesting again, consistent with the DOT recommended standard, that the installation of this flashing beacon that would only be flashing when a pedestrian pushes the button would be an appropriate additional investment to, to negotiate the safety for those pedestrians and bicycles seeking to cross at this location. And the last point I want to make on this last slide is that what we are suggesting is in fact, yeah, go ahead to the next one, Alyssa, the, the last slide here is that what we're suggesting is indeed consistent with a design document that was actually created by District 4 last year to address this very condition. DOT said, hey, we understand that interchanges are difficult for pedestrians and bicyclists to negotiate safely. And we think in particular that unsignalized right turn ramps create potential vulnerabilities. They, they create a potentially unsafe condition for the pedestrian and bicyclist seeking to cross these locations. And therefore, in our list of improvements, we identify the DOT in their own design guidance to their staff, identify the desire to install the same devices that we've suggested to you this morning are appropriate. These pedestrian actuated warning beacon beacons or uh, RRFBs, rectangular rapid flash beacons, at these unsignalized right turn ramps. So what we're suggesting is a modification to the DOT for their consideration and asking you to endorse so that we can make this a formal request to the TPA board is actually something that's consistent with the design document that they've established themselves. Uh, so the last slide is, uh, again, we're, we're asking you to make a motion to adopt the resolution this morning that endorses the creativity associated with the diverging diamond interchange and makes a request formally for the DOT to consider these couple of modifications as part of their interchange evaluation. And Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation. I'll make that motion. Do I have a motion on the floor from Commissioner Mao Shang? Do I have a second? Second, Singer. Thank you. Before we do that, are there, is, there, is there any public comments on this? No, Madam Chair. Okay, perfect. I do have that um, Vice Mayor Weiner list up in San Reese before we take the vote. Perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, obviously, uh, I come from Oak Ridge Home. I'm familiar with this intersection. Um, Wage Roads is a constrained roadway as a result of prior uh, action of the Oak Ridge Home City Council. And this intersection has been a choke point for years. So I, I applaud my colleagues back in Boca for embracing this. Uh, ambitious DEI as a, a real opportunity for moving the traffic along and addressing what has been a problem for years. I remember the original iteration of this project with the um, many uh, overpasses and, and other ways of trying to get people through this intersection. I think this is much sweeter However, I think we need to step back uh, on, on the points that now the TPA is making. I'm not quite sure I can embrace the first suggestion, and I'll defer to Commissioner Balachet being our resident bicyclist as far as whether traveling between two auto travel lanes is something that someone who is less sophisticated than he would feel comfortable even being uh, involved in. I think that that probably is not uh, a comfortable situation to find yourself in with, with vehicles traveling both on your right and on your left. As far as the other two suggestions, 
you know, I have been railing against Vision Zero. To me, Vision Zero has always been something of a, a misnomer to me because we know that we're never going to get the number of fatalities down to zero. So if we have one fatality, we fail, and therefore we can move on. If we are really going to embrace Vision Zero, we need to be also embracing what was one of the stated objectives of this project, improving operations and safety, benefiting pedestrians. We need to give the pedestrians a fighting chance to get through this intersection. And I think the suggestion two and suggestion three, as far as lighting and putting the RRFBs into the project are something that needs to be done if we are going to give pedestrians any sort of an opportunity to have safety as they're crossing through this intersection. And I certainly understand that there are uh, arguments against any traffic control because it's going to probably create rear enders. But certainly a rear ender between motor vehicles is far more uh, tolerable than a situation of a motor vehicle running over a pedestrian. So I think if we are truly committed to our mission of Vision Zero, then it would be difficult not to uh, support the safer condition for people walking, uh, item two and item three proposed by the TTA. So I'm gonna be a very strong proponent of number one, embracing this design for this intersection. And number two, uh, appending to it, the TPA's uh, suggestion number two and number three to make this a safer uh, intersection for people walking. Thank you. Thank you. How? Yeah, you know, I, I certainly I agree with uh, the vice mayor. It's it's much safer. I would just point out that I think one of our most recent bicycle fatalities happened exactly in that scenario where somebody was crossing the Palm Beach Bikes on ramp um, on the west side of uh, 95 and was hit by a car that was getting on to 95 and the, and the bicyclist subsequently died. So I could see, you know, if you displace that bicyclist one lane over, um, that right turning movement wouldn't have affected him. Um, and I think Nick is right, you know, it, you'll have a, a longer time to assess uh, when, you, when you should make the move from the outside to the, the lane that's between the through and the right turn lane. So I, I agree that this is a much, uh, much better plan to save many more lives. So how you're in concert with suggestion number one that Nick made then, is that correct? Yeah. Madam Chair, I do have Mayor Singer with his hand raised. Mayor Singer, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I wanted to put on record that the City of Boca Raton concurs with the recommendations of the TPA, and I want to thank uh, the TPA for the presentation. Um, since we've heard the recommendations, would either TPA or FDOT representatives care to comment on what FDOT's response is to the valid points raised? Well, Madam Chair, I can only mention that we've been in conversations with FDOT. They, they are supportive of the idea of installing the RRFBs at the crosswalks and would like more time to evaluate the potential impact of the conversion of a shared lane from, to a uh, exclusive right turn lane before consenting to that modification. Thank you. More questions? Yes, I do have Councilmember Thompson and then Vice Mayor Wayne Ross. Thank you. Councilmember Thompson, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, from the beginning, I think maybe I was somewhat skeptical of the DDI proposal. I mean, it seemed kind of, I don't want to say revolutionary, but you, you never want the, the you would never, you, it feels like you don't want to be the guinea pig for something like this. But over time, I've studied it, worked with TPA, worked with FDOT, and we at the city, including me, have come around to this 
creative solution. And, and we have, and I, I, again, like Nick said earlier, I give FDOT a lot of credit because their staff has worked with us at the city, you know, over many months to address a number of questions that staff had raised and have resolved those issues to the staff satisfaction, to the city's satisfaction. And so I, I very much appreciate the work that FDOT has put in on that. But I do think, you know, we're not, we're not at the goal line just yet. We're at about the five yard line. And with these improvements and in, in that regard, I, I, I trust the TPA staff in making these recommendations. Uh, I think that these will get us to the point where the city's fully on board with it. I'll be fully on board with it. And I plan on supporting these three recommendations that the TPA has, has offered today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Weinwald. Thank you. Uh, I have one more point. That's, uh, in addition to what we've discussed here today, um, as part of this uh, express lane project, there's going to be a closure of the Clintmore overpass uh, over I-95 coming up. Not right now, according to plan, being at the same time, but there's only about a two month gap in the timeline between this closure and the closure about a mile north. Um, the city of Boca Raton is in a situation where uh, making east-west uh, uh, travel, especially if there's any uh, issues on the rail tracks, is going to be very difficult, especially while Clintmore is closed and it's going to be a complete closure. I would like to add into our motion that there be a uh, caveat that the project at Clintmore not commence until this project is completed to foreclose the possibility of east-west travel being uh, constrained both at Glades and on Clintmore. I'll make that in the form of a, a, a friendly amendment to the motion. Substitute motion, correct. Um, so we have a substitute motion, and do we have any other discussion on the substitute motion? And do we have any other hands raised, by the way? No, Matt. Oh, I'm sorry. Mayor Singer has his hand raised. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Perhaps FDOT would be willing to opine now as to um, what the timing implications would be if we went down this path and how feasible this is. Obviously, we all share the goal of ensuring um, smooth travel within our city and everywhere. Hi, this is Andy Piccini. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So, um, as Jose mentioned, I'll be the public information officer for this project. And I just wanted to clarify that the Glades Road East West um, movements will not have a full closure during the time of construction. We do work around peak hour time. So our daytime single lane closures will be during off peak hours, which I believe are currently um, in the proposal as 9.30 to 4 p.m. And then we'll do multi-lane closures and ramp closures at night um, so that we're minimally impacting traffic. So I believe those times of closures are nine to five. So 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, there will be one full weekend closure of the Glades Road interchange because we'll need to tie in, but that will be coordinated well in advance and it'll be towards the end of this pro of, of the Glades Road DDI interchange construction, which currently is scheduled for um, later 2022. So right now, I will say that the Clint Moore Road Bridge reconstruction, as well as the Glades Road Interchange DDI are currently slated to both begin around January 2021. But we will not be having full closures during the Glades Road, during the majority of the Glades Road um, DDI construction. It'll just be single lane during the day, and then we'll do the majority of it at night. Thank you for that clarification. So, thank you. You're squashing your mouth. Um, I, I'm not quite sure from the prior presentation. Are you, are you saying that there are not going to be overlaps in, in periods of time when uh, traffic will be constrained on Glades and when there's a full closure on Clintmore? 
Correct. We will not have a full closure at Glades Road at the same time that we're having a full closure at Clintmore. We will be having daytime single lane closures during off peak hours on Glades and we'll be having multi lane and ramp closures during the nighttime only during the DDI work. But, but the full closure of Glades will not coincide with the full closure of Clintmore Road. That's on paper. How close uh, is the timeline between the two projects? So um, the reason we're doing the full closure at the Clint of the Clintmore Road for that um, bridge reconstruction is to actually expedite the construction time. So we're shaving off almost a year of construction time on that bridge by doing the full closure. So we're anticipating 15 month um, closure for the Clintmore Road bridge. And if we start in January, that puts us into spring 2022. And then we'll have that full weekend closure on Glades Road for the tie-in towards the end of that construction, which would be towards the end of the year 2022. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I do have hands raised. I believe it's from other project staff on this item. I'm not sure if you want to allow us to speak as well. I think their input would be important. Okay. So I have, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name, Tamer Sa, um, you need to unmute on your end. And then I did have Scott Passmore, but he's over his hand. Yes, this is Timir Shah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, express this uh, information. Uh, just quick clarification for the Clintmore Road complete closure. Uh, we will have the provision of uh, allowing the emergency vehicle to pass through during the uh, construction of the Clintmore Road. I just wanted to clarify that in addition to what Andy just uh, 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 said. And also, I'd like to add one more um, piece of clarification that the Clintmore Road bridge reconstruction and the Glades Road DDI are all part of the same contract under 95 Express Phase 3B2. So they're not separate contracts. They're all part of this scope. Thank you. Any other hands raised? No, Madam Chair. So please uh, remind me where, Nick, remind me where we are at the moment. Well, Madam Chair, you have a substitute motion by Commissioner Weinroth, but he did not receive a second at this time. So I guess we would need to either hear a second or go back to the primary motion. Madam Chair, I'm going to withdraw my motion uh, just so it doesn't muddy this up. I think uh, FDOT has heard our comments and hopefully they'll be uh, responsible and ensure that the city of Boca Raton is not uh, placed in a situation where they have two roads that are closed at the same time, especially for, again, emergency vehicles and for east-west travel by their stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your clarifying the fact that emergency vehicles will be able to get through that closure. Uh, so we have a motion and, and do we need a motion and a second for the first motion? We, I'm sorry, I need to repeat myself. Okay. We had a motion by uh, Commissioner Balashay and a second by Mayor Singer on the original motion. On the original motion, okay. And we need a roll call vote, correct? Yes, Madam uh, Chair. All right, we have a roll call vote at this time. Joseph Anderson. Yes, still absent. Um, Matt Bernard? Here. Yes. Joni Brinkman? Yes. Joel Flores, I believe, is still absent. Uh, Stephen Grant? Yes. Jim Koretsky? Yes. Douglas Lawson? Yes. Graham Rayham? Yes. Melissa McKinley? Yes. Michael Napoleon? Yes. Corey Neary? Yes. Joseph Peduzzi? Yes. Shelly Petroleum? Yes. Brad Pinto? Yes. Scott Singer? Yes. Andy Thompson? Yes. Andy Amoroso? Yes. Kyle Valache? Yes. Robert Weinrock? Yes. Greg Weiss? Yes. Steve Wilson? Yes. And passes unanimously, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion also. And at that, um, I will now move to information items. And it looks like State Road 80 Lighting Justification Report. I'd like to invite Scott Peterson from FDOT District Roadway Design Engineer to present this item. 
Yes, hello, this is Scott Peterson. I am actually going to have our district uh, traffic plans engineer and lighting engineer, Anna Plegachova, do the presentation, but I will be available as will Anna for questions afterwards. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Anna Plegachova. I'm the FDOT District 4 traffic design engineer, as Scott just said. I'm here today to give a summary of all the safety improvements constructed on the Stero 80 corridor from Stero 15 or US 441 to County Road 880 and to present the results from the latest lighting justification report uh, for the same limits. As you can see in the agenda, I'll be talking about the study location, limits, the length of the project, previous safety studies, recommendations, and implementations, ongoing intersection lighting improvements, and how extensive those limits are, typical conditions where um, roadway lighting is installed, crash data and benefit cost analysis used to develop the current lighting justification report, and who to contact if you need any additional information. As you can see in this map, the lighting justification limits for the Stero 80 corridor start at Stero 15, or also known as Main Street, and ends at County Road 880 with an approximate length of 18.2 miles. Within the limits, there are four signalized intersections, which we, are, we will be highlighting in this presentation. They are Stero 15, North Sugar, Sugar House Road, Hatton Highway, and Stero 700. Um, the department has previously performed safety studies to identify any deficiencies and to improve the safety conditions for these limits. Uh, one of the studies recommended guardrails guard installation and extension, shoulder widening, median crossovers, fog detection system, milling and resurfacing, intersection lighting upgrade at 0700, within other improvements as shown in the table. But corridor lighting uh, was not part of the recommendations. As you can see, construction of all those improvements were completed between 2012 and 2018. And then in 2018, the department revisited the same limits and an additional safety study was performed. This study recommended the installation of intersection lighting at three signalized intersections that I will be explaining a little bit more over. Um, and those three locations are expected to be completed by March 2021. Um, as I just mentioned, the 2019 safety study investigated the need for lighting on the Stero 80, Stero 80 corridor, uh, but only recommended the installation of lighting at the three intersections of Stero 15, West Sugar Road House Road and Hatton Highway. Again, corridor uh, white lighting was not recommended from a safety perspective. One thing um, I wanted to point out when talking about signalized intersection lighting is that the lighting analysis and installation is not only bounded by the stubborn locations of the intersections. Instead, it includes uh, minimum distance, the minimum distance required to allow the driver to safely stop at the intersection if necessary. Showing this in this slide is like the lighting intersection boundaries for each location, which we have a minimum of 750 feet. Um, so, how the installation of lighting is evaluated from a safety perspective. Typically, um, locations include urban corridors and transition to urban areas where there is a significant conflict with driveways and side streets. Locations where pedestrians and bicycle activities present, as in sidewalks, mid-block crossings, and crosswalks. Another indication that lighting might need to be installed is when the number of nighttime crashes is double the number of the daytime crashes and when the existing nighttime crashes are greater than the statewide average of 30%. Once the, lighting, once the installation of lighting is determined from a safety perspective, the next step will be to prioritize those locations to maximize the safety improvements due to limited resources. Um, as you can see in the slide, and as per the lighting justification report, none of those conditions are applicable for this corridor. 
So the purpose of the crash data analysis was to identify the location, time, and number of crashes within the safety study limits and be able to determine if lighting installation was necessary from a safety perspective. Crash data from April 2016 to January 2020, which is pre-COVID-19 time, was obtained and analyzed. As a result, it was found that 145 crashes, which are 93% of the total, occur at signalized intersections. Those locations are already lit, or lighting installation is expected to be completed by March 2021, as I probably explained um, on these slides. Um, the remaining 11 crashes, which is 7% of the total, occur at the seconds. From those 11, seven occur during daytime at the inter at, at daytime, I'm sorry, and the remaining four, which are 2.5 percent of the of the total, occur at nighttime and are not intersection related. These 2.5 percent is below the average statewide um, nighttime crashes of 30 percent. Um, in addition to the crash data analysis. The lighting justification report reviews the benefit cost ratio for the requested improvement. If the location is identified as a high crash and it has a benefit cost ratio of one or greater, the location is selected for further review and prioritization. If the location is not considered as a high crash, it will require a benefit cost of at least two to be considered. Um, the lighting justification report calculated a benefit cost ratio of 0.7 for this um, limits, not meeting either requirement from a safety perspective. In addition, it was estimated a project cost of $16.52 million, to, which includes the design, construction, and CI cost, and a yearly operation and maintenance cost of $350,000 annually. Based on all the information provided in this presentation, um, the lighting justification report concluded that corridor wire lighting is not warranted nor justified from a safety perspective. If you would like to request any additional information about this presentation or the lighting justification report, you can contact me or Guillermo, Guillermo Canelo from FDOT Communication Manager if you see necessary. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any cards on this? Any discussion from the public? There's no public comments. However, I have Mayor Wilson and Commissioner Weiss with hands raised. Absolutely. Mayor Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to our, our board members. I see a lot of new faces, and I'll start by saying to all of you, thank you for being a part of this, this board. Um, if many of you recall, we've been talking about this for over 10 years now. Um, thank, thank the presenter. But a couple of things she said, first day she indicated, well, how expensive this project may be. Now, I never heard that before. I've never heard it since I've been sitting on this board about how expensive something would be when it comes to the safety of, of people's lives. The second thing that she indicated that uh, the study came back to approve guardrails. That is not true. In 2012, the study came back and said, no, there was no need for guardrails. But because two weeks after the study came out, board members, there was a family of three, a mother and her two kids, went into the canal, were missing for two days. And um, the, the politicians, the powers to be, the board members decided that we need to do something about the guardrails. And within two or three months, there was $4.4 million allocated to get those guardrails up. My point is this. I think uh, Vice Mayor Ryan Roth had it right. We all disagreed with him a couple months ago before COVID-19 when he said zero tolerance or uh, zero vision. Guess what? How can it be zero vision when we continue basing studies on how many people are going to die or how many crashes we have with cars and trucks before we decide to do anything about it? Ten years, y'all, we've been talking about this. For those of you who've been around, we shouldn't have to wait any longer to get the, get the lighting up in, in the glazed community. I mean, think about it. I heard about bike lanes and with respect to the cyclists, that's good. But what about the lights coming out here? Many of you don't travel the roads at night coming out to the glazed community. You don't know the conditions out there. I'm asking this board, which we already agreed some time ago, 
that worst case, if the study come back and said no, then we still want to find a way to get this project funded. And we shouldn't have to wait any longer. I had a nice conversation with um, uh, Nick. Uh, we had a long conversation and he's trying to think outside the box. I want this board to think outside the box, how we can accelerate this, this, this project. It's been too long, y'all. We've been waiting too long to get the lightning out there. And again, when I hear things like, how expensive? What that tells me? I never heard that before. I'm appalled by that, that comment. And I know she probably didn't mean anything about it, but I'm telling y'all, it shouldn't be measured based on cost when it comes down to people's lives. We keep talking about our mission is zero tolerance. Well, guess what? If we find that there's issues out here, we need to resolve it and we need to do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. Commissioner Weiss. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's certainly uh, uh, support a lot of the comments that Mayor Wilson made, but I also want to bring up, I mean, we should, you, you didn't mention the severity of these accidents. I mean, you know, there, there can be very severe accidents, in which case, you know, there may not be a huge number of them, but uh, how severe they are um, should be a part of this as well. And I'm, I'm surprised that there's no information about that. Additional hands raised. Yes, thank you. Uh, Weinro, followed by Grant, and then I have more, but I'll start with those two. Okay. Yeah, you, you know, I, I have listened to Mayor Wilson carry the water on this for so long, and I applaud you for taking the safety of your stakeholders to heart and i know that we all have the same concerns that you do and i wonder if this was a road on its way to palm beach versus a road on its way to the glades whether we would be having the conversation mayor about the cost and so i think that uh, we need to step back and say why are we suddenly worried about cost when that is not generally the conversation we're having. And I thank you for embracing the idea that if we're going to really have a vision zero objective, then we need to truly look at what needs to be done to bring our, ourselves there. Uh, several weeks ago, I left a meeting of the uh, commission to go to Fort Myers in the evening and drove along that dark road and felt that it was not a comfortable road to drive at night. And I don't know if it takes one death, two deaths. I don't know what the price is that makes us respond with a solution that will eliminate the possibility of our residents being put into an unsafe situation. I mean, right now we're dealing with a pandemic and we're dealing with very small numbers, but we're also dealing with, you know, a, a need to protect our residents. And I think we need to be using the same type of, of mentality in looking at this. And just because it's out in the glades, there's nothing different about the residents out there than the residents living on Palm Beach. And there, we're not going to value what is the, the need for these uh, safety uh, improvements. I've also had conversations with Nick on this. And I knew that uh, this was not going to be something that uh, Mayor Wilson was going to accept sitting down. Um, Nick has mentioned that we have an opportunity to look at perhaps reordering some of our local initiatives and seeing where we can find this $15 million to do the cost of, of uh, moving this forward. I also understand that the FDOT would be willing to partner in the operational expenses of this uh, particular enhancement. And I think that what is needed now is for the uh, for Nick and for representatives of this body to 
communicate with the county, whether it be David Ricks or Todd Von Laren or Virginia Baker, and to ascertain their ability to bring to the table the remainder of the operational expenses for those lights. I think that is way beyond time for us to be dealing with this. And that DOT see, does not see this as statistical rationale for implementing this. I think that it is up to us to find the solution. I don't think that we are, uh, again, if we are committed to Vision Zero, this is a particularly uh, egregious situation. It may not have numbers to justify it, but it's certainly a situation where if you're driving on there, you do not feel safe and comfortable, and we need to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Gray. Thank you. Um, you know, the city of Boynton Beach. Hello. Uh, so in the city of Boynton Beach, we are the only ones in Palm Beach County with red light cameras. And well, one of the things that happened is everyone said, oh, they're not working because there's more crashes. And I had to explain to them that that's not the number you need to look at. You need to look at what is the total damage that is occurred? What is the pain and suffering that has happened to those people in those crashes? You know, the, the, the statistic that they gave us was the crashes at the intersection. However, that includes, I believe, 200 feet before the lights, not just in the intersection. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're proud of Boyd Beach that is part of the red light camera red light camera program, there has not been a fatality at any of those intersections. Um, for me, moving forward, yes, we, we need to have lights because it's not necessarily the amount of crashes that is important, it is the amount of damage that is important. It's the amount of pain and suffering that occurs when you're going 50 plus miles per hour and you have an accident. It's, it's very different than in a city road where you're going 35, 40. So that's uh, why I'm in favor of this uh, to move forward and with whatever the TPA can do. Um, my conversation with uh, Nick was that if we could bifurcate it to over two years, uh, because it is a great distance of 16 miles, I don't think someone uh, can do this all in one year anyway. Uh, and that's something that I'd like to see. I understand it would be maybe missing some economies of scale, but I think it's something that we should look at uh, so that we can accomplish the start of the program center. Thank you. Do we have any other hands up? Yes, I have Mayor Pinto followed by Commissioner McKenzie. Mayor Pinto. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I seem to be hearing a consensus forming that I think is uh, the direction we need to go. Um, I know for at least five years I've sat down at the at TPA meetings and listened to this a request coming from Mayor Wilson saying, uh, help us out here, let's get some lighting. And there's been story after story, we finally got the study done and I knew this was gonna happen. They were gonna do the study and come back and say, based on their, their guidelines and their rules and their metrics, um, it, it's not uh, cost effective to do this. Well, I think, uh, hope all of you have had individual discussions with Nick, that there is a way that we can do it as a TPA, we can fund this. And there's two pieces to it. There's the funding of the actual project, which can be done over one or two year period, which means we would put that money on the table to, for that 16.3 million. And then there's the second component, which is the O&M, the operations and maintenance going forward, which was discussed as being about $350,000. My understanding is 90% of those funds, if they're provided by the county on an annual basis, can be reimbursed to the county. So we're talking about 10 to $20,000 difference here on an ongoing basis uh, in terms of making this happen. And I will like to ask Madam Chair and Nick, at this meeting right now, what can we do to move forward with that concept of the TPA putting that money up front? And, and I know this will be in the out years, and I know the funds we're talking about would mean those years when this is being funded, individual cities, we will not have the same amount of funds available for the small projects that we normally get funded through this mechanism. So I'd just like to ask, what do we need to do now to move forward with this concept, Nick and Madam Chair? Thank you, Mayor Pinto. And before we move to Nick to answer that, Melissa McKinley, you have some questions? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I actually have some comments and I uh, want to thank my colleagues uh, 
uh, for all of your very favorable comments this morning and for your assistance in helping me um, get Mayor Wilson uh, quit chasing me down every meeting I see him at <laughs> about these lights. Um, so it's, it's been wonderful to work with the mayors of the Glaze on this particular project. But while I certainly uh, want to thank Secretary O'Reilly and his team at uh, DOD and our district office here, they've been wonderfully responsive to several different safety issues in the Glaze community that they're working on, particularly up around the Pahokee area. But I have to disagree with their assessment on this one. Um, because we're, I understand they've got formulas that they have to abide by, but this particular road is different. And I know Commissioner Weinbach said it's a road on its way to the Glades and not on its way to Palm Beach, but as you know, having just driven to Fort Myers, that when you jump on the, the west end of this road, it is called Palm Beach Road. So it is a road on its way to Palm Beach too. It's the only thoroughfare that connects the Glades community and even uh, if you want to go a little bit further west into Hendry County, that connects them to, to Palm Beach County. And a lot of the residents in those, in these two particular communities of both uh, Western Palm Beach County and Hendry County, they come to Palm Beach County for, for entertainment. They come to our, our grocery stores and our other types of stores. I mean, we are the closest commercial hub for them. In addition, you're not talking about an average four-door sedan or a pickup truck driving these roads. You're talking about major uh, aggregate trucks coming in and out of Palm Beach. Uh, aggregates there, you're talking about utility trucks coming out of the FPNL power plant, and you're talking about very large tractor trailers coming out of the agricultural community. In addition, I mean, the U.S. Department of Transportation just allowed uh, agricultural entities there to uh, use larger trucks to transport goods in these COVID times that we're dealing with. So that is an even more dangerous situation than you might look at um, other areas of the state with rural roads that don't have traffic lights. And I will tell you, I've driven all over rural Florida this summer in my new role with the Association of Counties. And I've driven on a lot of roads that are really dark, but these aren't roads that have the same side, uh, same type of commercial traffic that this particular segment of State Road 80 uh, experiences on a daily basis. In addition, we all know that uh, Florida in the summertime can tend to get dark around three or four in the afternoon when those dark thunderstorms start rolling through. So I wouldn't pay particular attention to just the nighttime data on that. It can be dark at other times of the day. Uh, we also have uh, smoke that we have to deal with from time to time on these roads, and we've got fog, significant fog, certain times of the year. So all of that combined just makes for a very dangerous situation. I 100% agree with what Mayor Wilson said that uh, one life is worth a traffic or a, a street light. In terms of funding, before George Webb left and uh, prior to the arrival of some of my colleagues on the county commission, the county had already agreed to fund its portion of the operations and maintenance costs should this project move forward. And I'm sure Mr. Ricks can resurface that letter and that agreement was discussed at a commission meeting, so it's on the record. Uh, in addition, I understand after speaking with my staff this morning that there is funding um, readily available from prior budgets uh, for transportation-related costs that we can probably tap into if we decided to move forward with this item. But uh, again, just want to thank my colleagues for, for their support of our rural communities and recognizing that this situation on this road is unique. Um, I don't want to continue to push this out into the future. I know that Nick and his team bumped this up and would like to continue to see it where it's at if it's not sooner. Um, so with that, I would like to give formal staff direction to uh, enter into conversations with the counties transportation division in terms of funding and with the OT to try to make this Thank you, Commissioner McKinley. Do we have any other questions or comments? Hands raised, I should say. This one. 
Oh, I was going to say, and no hand raising except for Mayor Wilson. Mayor Wilson, go right ahead. Mountain Chair, and to all the board members, I, if I can give you hugs and kisses on behalf of the Glaze community, thank you guys for your comment and your support on this project. It, it means a lot to the Glaze resident, but more importantly, it means a lot to Palm Beach County. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. Nick, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I'm just going to make a couple of clarifying points. First, the project is already a TPA priority, which said we would like to fund the implementation of streetlights on this corridor. The intent of doing this safety study was to fund them with either federal safety dollars or state resources, state gas taxes available for the installation costs of the street lighting. Uh, because the lighting study did not come back favorably, those two options are taken off the table, but that means we still have the opportunity to fund the construction costs, the design, the construction, and the CEI phases of that pie chart that was in the presentation. Those can be funded through the TPA's local initiatives program. And I want to remind you that the TPA's local initiatives program is funded with federal surface transportation block grant funds. We receive about $20 million a year allocated to just Palm Beach County to construct, to design and construct the projects that are specifically identified by this TPA governing board. And so what I'm hearing is a general direction to fund the uh, design and construction of the streetlights out of that local initiatives pot of money. What I wanna also clarify is that the DOT has said, even though the lighting study didn't come back favorably, that they are willing to provide subsidies for the operation and maintenance of the streetlights consistent with their current agreement, or, or current reimbursement agreement with Palm Beach County, which in practical terms means that they will reimburse the county for $300 per light pole. There are 997 light poles predicted to be necessary for this installation. So that equates to around $295,000 per year that the DOT would be willing to reimburse to Palm Beach County for the operation and maintenance. For a 20 year lifespan of the project, when the DOT is making that commitment, they're essentially saying that they're willing to allocate $6 million over the life of these uh, streetlights to the operations and maintenance. The last piece of the puzzle is the county's willingness to accept the operation and maintenance responsibility, paying those costs up front and getting reimbursed for the portion of those costs that the DOT is willing to support. There may be, as we have identified in the presentation, there may be a small delta. If the actual prediction, if the prediction becomes an actual O&M cost, we think that the annual cost to the county might be around $315,000. The DOT will reimburse the county for around $295,000, which means the county would have to accept the outcome of paying the remaining $20,000 a year out of pocket. That would make the county's contribution to the streetlights over the 20 year lifespan of those lights right around $500,000. So I think we have a way to fund this. I'm hearing support for this and it's already a, a TPA priority. So I think I can work with the department to fund the design and construction of these streetlights as quickly as possible. I only want to make one last clarifying remark. It, it's a reminder to the TPA governing board members that while I want to work as quickly as possible to implement projects within your elected tenures, as quickly as possible in the transportation world usually means five to seven years. And that's because we have already identified in a commitment to other locations, what we would like to do with the transportation resources available to us over the next five years. So we will move as quickly as possible, but I want to just encourage you to be mindful that transportation projects move slightly faster than molasses, but slow compared to most other things in the world. Thank you, Nick. And we do have our local initiatives that we've already approved, so that would be, have to be taken into too, correct? That's correct. We just adopted a priority list in July and transmitted that list to the department. So we would be uh, in a simultaneous condition while we're developing the draft work program, we would be seeking to find the additional priorities of the TPA and 
finding the money to implement the design and the, and the construction costs associated with the streetlights. And we will be having, I anticipate in our October meetings, a conversation about the impacts of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic on transportation revenues and how that affects our ability to program other initiatives uh, on the TPS priority list. So I, I hear the direction to make it happen and to make it happen quickly. I'm just asking for uh, tempered expectations with, with the uh, speed at which transportation projects move and the funding that we have available to do all the other things as well as this project that's important to the TPA. Thank you. And do we have any more questions? Or comments? Yes, I do have a motion McKinley followed by Vice Mayor Wyckoff. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and if it's okay, I'll, I'll come back and flip the switch after I turn off. <laughs> but uh, just can we, can we look at, and we want to hear the number of light poles that are recommended. Um, can we look at other localities across the nation to see how they're doing rural road lighting? Um, it, it, I know the need is there, but that many number, that that high number of light poles um, sounds a little bit like we're overdoing it. And I, I would think that some rural communities across the country have some out of the box ways of lighting their rural roads. And Vice Mayor Weinrock. Yeah, I, I think that uh, from this conversation, I think uh, giving direction to Mick and, uh, and the TPA uh, leadership to and reach out to the county at this point because we're going to need their partnership in this if we're going to go forward. Uh, I certainly uh, embrace the uh, suggestion by Commissioner McKinley that we take a look at the design of this to see what is appropriate. Obviously, there's new technologies and lighting and probably the uh, the standard might be uh, different although because we're paying on three hundred dollars per pole there's still going to be a a, uh, a contribution required by the county we're not going to be able to knock out 20 poles and then say okay the fdot you can pick up the whole thing so at some point the county is going to have to be a partner in this so uh, it's going to be necessary for, again, the uh, uh, David Ricks, Tom Von Laren, Virginia Baker, uh, and ultimately the Board of County Commissioners to uh, uh, embrace this project. But I, I certainly would like to see us go forward. Uh, Nick, what needs to be done as far as getting this into the uh, priorities for the local initiatives? Well, again, Commissioner, it's already on our TPA priority list. We, we show it on the state road modifications list because we had hoped that it would be able to be funded and funded more quickly using state gas taxes and or federal safety dollars. Uh, we, we can hear this discussion and migrate that project over to the local initiatives program with direction to the DOT to use some of our STP funds to fund the design and construction. Okay. Do you need a formal motion on that, or can we do that as a direction? I think we can do it under as direction. I, I think we've heard direction. If, you know, the, the priority list showed the desired outcome for funding sources to implement the projects on the various lists, but they're not rigid lines. There, there are some state road modifications that would pull from the federal STP funds that we use for local initiatives, and there are sometimes local initiative projects uh, that take advantage of state road funding. Uh, we hear you, we're gonna to try to find a way to make it happen. Okay, I appreciate that. And because of term limits, I guess uh, Chair Marino may be the only one still in this room. <laughs> if it went this- There will uh, be lights before eight years from now. <laughs> if I have any say on that. Do we have any more comments or questions, hands raised? I have Mayor Wilson with his hand raised. Mayor Wilson. Yeah. Uh, the last comment, uh, again, I, I appreciate the Nick leadership, but let's not wait six years to make this happen, Nick. We, we, we can think outside the box. We can be creative. Uh, we've been talking about it again for 10 years. Let's look at it in the next two years, worst case. I'm sure you can find ways and means to make this happen and not wait six years down the road. Uh, please, let's make that happen. Thank you. Um, I just I just looked over at uh, Commissioner Vice Mayor White Ross and said, you know, we've been talking about this since I first got on TPA, and that was four years ago. And the fact that we've been talking about it for ten is is uh, 
kind of sad and the fact that people have to die in order to in implement things that make us safer is even more sad. But I think we've exhausted all the possibilities on how we're going to get uh, federal or state dollars. So it's, not, it's incumbent on us to do this here locally with TVA, with our local initiatives. And I, for one, think that, yes, I don't want to wait six years either. And if, uh, as, as uh, Commissioner McKinley said, if there's a way we can be more creative, and if it takes three years, uh, is there you know, a different standard in lighting for three years than there is now? So these are all the things that we have to think about. But um, the direction from this board is very clear and very simple. This is something that the board wants. This is something that uh, we all want to support Mayor Wilson with, so the sooner the better. And I, I think that's, that, that's our direction. Nick, you, you've got your uh, task here. And I don't believe we have any more comments on that. So the next thing we have are just uh, partner agencies. And I don't see any partner agencies here in the room or anybody. I don't have any hands raised on the chair. So the, uh, what's left are the administrative items that are provided on our, um, our board sheet here. And there are no staff presentations on any of these. And I don't think there's any public comment on our administrative items. No, Madam Chair. So if any board member would like additional information on the administrative items, please get together with one of the um, one of our staff. And at this time, we're at the end of our agenda. And I want to say again that it's been my pleasure serving as the chair of this board. I think this is a very important agency, and I look forward to working with you again in the future. Ah, that's, that could be going for a month, but hopefully in November we can in uh, December I'll be back. Our next meeting is scheduled for October 15th, and at this time the TPA intends to conduct our October advisory committee and board meetings in person, but this may change if the governor extends permission to conduct virtual meetings. Thank you for your patience with us on all of this, and at this time I would like to adjourn the meeting.